Actually, the person in charge of the lights, if you could feel free to keep the lights up. Since this is a lunch and not a dinner, I don't think we need the drama of candlelight at our, at our meals, if, if everybody agrees. So my name is Joe Bast. I was your host for the last day and a half, along with James Taylor. Um, I am really, really pleased that all of you could attend. I think as you've noticed from how filled this room is, all 550 people who signed up for this event, uh, pretty much all 550 actually attended. Um, all 100 scientists and economists who agreed to speak attended, so we had all of the panels that were filled. Um, I think programmatically we had some of the most interesting and vibrant, fascinating presentations ever pulled together in a day and a half at a conference on global warming. <clears throat> Uh, we started with dinner on Sunday night, and you, those of you who are at dinner, you might remember that in order to get everybody to quiet down and sit down, we dimmed the lights, and we had this uh, disembodied voice from the back of the room. Um, and I had mentioned that we do that because at the Heartland Institute, uh, the crowds are usually so loud that they're just talking and talking, nobody sits down, nobody shuts up until you finally turn off the lights and run up the music and force people to, to get into their seats. And you folks all just sat down obediently and you were absolutely silent. The room was like dead silent for 60 seconds before I finally made it to the podium. I noticed you're a lot louder today and at breakfast uh, today than you were on that first night. I hope that that's a sign that you're no longer afraid to raise your voice and be heard on this controversial issue. I think the whole mood of this crowd has picked up. Uh, I think it's just fascinating. Uh, people who have never met before, who only traded email, who've only read each other's peer-reviewed literature from around the world have been able for the first time to meet each other and build real friendships. It's my hope that those friendships will last a lifetime and that this is just the beginning of what will be a very long-term intellectual movement in favor of sound science and, uh, and, and real science on climate change issues. I'm a little bit hoarse today, and I think some of the rest of you are. We had a constant stream of media coming through this conference yesterday, and they're here again this morning. I mean, I was interviewed probably a dozen times, uh, maybe you know, 20 times yesterday. Um, we had um, I think I listed them here, CBS, ABC, BBC, CNN, PBS. Some of you were on the Glenn Beck show. Did everybody see the Glenn Beck program yesterday? They did a great job representing us. Um, you may have seen us in the New York Times. We were in the New York Times twice, um, by, uh, articles by Andrew Rifkum. Um, and I noticed in both of his articles, he used the word dizzy. Uh, which I think to a liberal means that you've challenged my world view. Uh, so otherwise not such bad articles given the source. Uh, we were also in the Washington Post, uh, which some people refer to as the Pravda of Washington, D.C. Uh, and I thought uh, that was interesting because at one point in this article, um, Juliet Alperin, is that how it's pronounced? Alperin? Uh, says, uh, this conference poses a sharp contrast to the near unanimous chorus of concern expressed by top U.S. politicians and most of the scientific mainstream. So I'm reading that and I'm thinking, well, she's not really saying that there's a consensus, is she? Uh, you know, it's like somebody in the Soviet Union trying to write in a way that gets past the censors that doesn't quite repeat what they always used to repeat, that there is a unanimous consensus uh, in the scientific community. Now it's just a near unanimous chorus of concern expressed by politicians and most of the scientific mainstream. I think that's a victory. I think we've just won over the Washington Post. So a lot of people have asked, what's next? Uh, now that we've all gotten together, now that we know each other, now that we have this momentum going, what, what are we going to do with all of this uh, energy? Well, we're going to do a lot of things. Uh, some of you have seen the Manhattan Resolution, I think is what it's called. It was uh, kind of came from the floor, a summary of uh, areas that we agree on. I believe Lord Moncton did an earlier draft that was very long, and I believe it's now been shortened. 
If you'd like to sign that resolution, it's at the registration table. Okay, and uh, also if you would like to join the new International Climate Science Coalition as one of uh, the members of this new very important organization, you can find the order forms uh, at the registration table. There might also be order forms by the water coolers up against the, uh, the wall there. Um, we're working on Fred Singer's uh, non-governmental international panel on climate change report. Uh, we're going to finish the appendices for that and republish it as a full-size report, two or three hundred pages, uh, that can actually go mano a mano against the IPCC's report. We're going to publish many of the papers that were presented here. We're going to be working with the authors and the presenters to edit them and put them into a format that we can publish. We're debating whether to publish them as a book or publish them over the course of a year in four volumes of a quarterly journal on climate science. And we think that there's a market niche for that, and we'll be talking to some of you. If those of you who like that idea, uh, get in touch with me. Let me know, because we'd be looking for editors and an editorial staff and ideas on how to promote and distribute such a journal. We're putting together videos. All of the uh, presentations over the course of the last day and a half are videotaped. They're going to be posted on the Heartland Institute's website, and we're going to be making sure that all of our co-sponsors get links and files and whatever they need to get it on their websites as well. And we want to do that in a hurry. So we're not going to wait six months before this stuff is available online. You should start seeing the first material in, in a few days or, or in a week or so. Uh, some of you know John Fund from the Wall Street Journal. He's been covering this conference. Yeah, he's a good guy. Uh, John... There he is. Yeah, John's in the far back corner of the room. Uh, give him a punch in the arm on your way out, okay? Um, John mentioned to me earlier today what we really need is a speaker's bureau for climate change skeptics. Um, a picture, a bio, contact information, and a video clip that people who are putting on conferences uh, all around the world can take a look at and say, do I want this guy to speak at my conference? Well, we now have bios for 100 experts. We've got contact information for all of you guys, and we've got you all on video. So we're going to post that material on our website, probably publish some kind of a booklet that contains all your bios. We'll get your permission, maybe, first, or we'll... <laughs> if you don't get back to us soon enough, you will find yourself in the Speakers Bureau that the Heartland Institute will be distributing to media all around the country. Um, so those are some of the things that we're going to do by way of follow-up. Um, and one last word before I introduce Roy Spencer, uh, the first of two keynote speakers uh, for this final lunch. Uh, my friend Rob Bradley, some of you know Rob Bradley. Um, the first day of this conference, uh, Rob grabbed me by the arm and he said, Joe, this is, this is really different. We attend lots of conferences. We organize lots of events. This one is, has an entirely different feel. This is really big. This is really the first time that all these people have been brought together. Um, this is really committed to, to skepticism and inquiry and debate, and not just trying to put forward a preordained agenda of, of positions and policy ideas. And this is being done in the teeth of an almost hysterical PR campaign by the other side. All of the people in this room feel like they're lonely voices out there speaking the truth against an overwhelming PR machine and, and so-called consensus, this is the first time all these people are in one room, realize that they're not alone and that by working together they can make a difference. And he says there's a good parallel for this, and that is the first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947. And if you don't know about the Mont Pelerin Society, ask somebody at your table who probably knows about it. And if nobody at your table knows about it, Google it when you're done. Okay, but turn off your telephone and your BlackBerry right now so that you're not Googling it. Um, but that meeting took place, it was a meeting of classical liberal thinkers and scholars who were meeting at a time when free market ideas were at their lowest point and socialism was the conventional wisdom. It was the consensus of all smart people that socialism was the future. And this little ragtag group of independent scholars from all around the world got together at Mount Pelerin and started to, to network together, write books, share ideas, support each other. And 50 years later, 
the Berlin Wall falls and we see the end of the Soviet Union. So it was a tremendous moment in history. I think we have a chance of making this conference a similar moment in the history of debate over climate change. So thank you all again for being here. And we have two final speakers. The first is Dr. Roy Spencer. Roy Spencer is the principal research scientist for the University of Alabama at Huntsville and the U.S. science team leader for the advanced microwave scanning radiometer on NASA's Aqua satellite. In the past, he has served as science, I'm sorry, as senior scientist of climate studies at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Spencer is the recipient of NASA's Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement and the American Meteorological Society Special Award for his satellite-based temperature monitoring work. A tremendous leader in the cause for real science on climate change. Please welcome Dr. Roy Spencer. Yeah, probably is up. Good noon, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to try to put the lie to the claim that no real climate scientists um, publish evidence that doesn't agree with the idea that global warming is going to be a serious problem. I'm going to cover some results from a paper that we published last August that was largely ignored uh, by the media and by climate modelers alike, and then some recent work that uh, has been conditionally accepted for publication. I've been telling people the last couple of days that if I don't ever make any more significant findings in my career other than these two pieces of work, I'll die a happy man. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to see if I can do this from up here. It's kind of hard to not be able to, you know, take the lightsaber and point at the the figures, but let's start with this uh, global temperature plot. This, of course, is the temperatures that John Christie and I have been doing from uh, Earth orbiting satellites for the last, well, we've been at it now for close 20 years, I guess. It's 30 years of temperatures up through January of this year, uh, showing a little bit of what we'll just call global warming for now, okay? Um, <clears throat> the thing I want to talk about is all those bumps on the line. All those bumps on the temperature trace for those global temperatures represent interesting things that are happening in the climate system. And how do we find out how sensitive the climate system is to increasing carbon dioxide? There isn't any experiment you can do in the lab to find out. There's just one experiment. We're all part of it right now. And the only way we can figure out how much global warming we're going to see, if any, from extra CO2 is by examining how the real climate system works, right? especially these bumps on the line. These tell us something about how the climate system works from one year to the next. So ideally what you want to do is have a, a lot of data from a whole bunch of satellites that measure, measure all kinds of things. Now being ex-NASA, I'm in favor of a mission to planet Earth and the satellites we've put up there, that's actually where uh, most of the billions of dollars went. It didn't go to a bunch of climate modelers, it went to NASA to build the satellites and, the, and launch them up there. Um, the first main uh, Earth observation satellite in this age of mission to planet Earth was the NASA Terra satellite. Now notice that it's only been providing data since about early 2000. So to study the bumps on the line, that natural climate variability, all those uh, jaggedy things there, uh, we don't have that much data yet. Uh, but we can still learn some interesting things. Uh, the satellite I'm involved with um, with the uh, Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer, that's on the NASA Aqua satellite. We have even less data from that in instrument. Now, to me the big question when you ask how much global warming are we going to see from extra CO2 is how sensitive is the climate system? That's basically what all of this comes down to. All of the uncertainty comes down to how sensitive in the, is, the, is the climate system. If you've heard about feedbacks, it's the same basic thing. Climate sensitivity goes as one over the feedbacks. So if you know the feedbacks, you know the climate sensitivity, and I'll probably use them kind of interchangeably. Um, now, as Bill Gray mentioned this morning, if all you did was just double the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere, now this is a theoretical calculation. Everyone agrees with it, but it, it's theoretical, okay, because you can't do this in nature. 
Uh, if you double the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, you're only going to get about one degree C of warming, which yawn isn't, isn't that much to be worried about. <clears throat> and that isn't going to occur until late this, uh, this century. So everything else that happens in the climate system we call feedback. How will clouds change from that little bit of warming? Will they change in such a way to amplify it or to actually cut back on it? Uh, Amplifying feedbacks, we call positive feedbacks, even though they're kind of negative. <laughs> uh, and um, things that reduce uh, the sensitivity of the climate system are called negative feedbacks. They fight against, you know, if there's a warming influence, the negative feedbacks fight against that warming and reduce them. Okay, now the real concern amongst climate modelers is positive feedbacks. Big intra-seasonal oscillations in tropospheric temperature. Um, now, what I did was we took 15 of the strongest ones over six years that we have NASA's uh, Terra satellite data. We only have, you know, six or seven years to work with now. Composited 15 of these guys together to see how clouds changed as they evolved and how water vapor changed and how uh, rainfall changed. In other words, understand how, you know, how this main mode of, of tropical climate variability works. Now, uh, this might be a little difficult. This is, we get all kinds of time series here representing 60 days from the center of the, uh, actually zero, zero, if you go right down the center of those graphs, that represents the day of maximum tropical temperatures. And then it goes 30 days before that to the left, 30 days after that to the right. So we're compositing about the warmest uh, tropical temperatures. And uh, the top one, the red line, actually shows that tropical temperature. It's the red line that looks like a pyramid. And I've got some other stuff there, water vapor and wind speed and how those things change as this composite interseasonal oscillation evolves through its lifetime. Now that second one with the hump there, uh, those humps, that's above normal rainfall that we measure from satellite, which corresponds to the warming you see in that red pyramid in the first panel. And this, there's nothing new about this. This is totally expected. When the tropics heat up, it's because you have above normal rainfall activity. Rainfall represents heat that's been transferred from the surface when the water was evaporated until it's released when the clouds form. And that's what causes these big events in the, in the tropics to heat up or cool down. It's generally related to more rainfall activity or less rainfall activity. So there's nothing new there. More rainfall, that hump in the second panel, causes the warming trend you see in the first panel. Okay. Now, here's where things get different. This is from uh, NASA's series instrument, which measures radiative fluxes. Solar uh, reflected, SW there is, is uh, solar reflected, and then LW is emitted long wave. Now, the solar short wave, reflected solar short wave, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but it's a hump that looks like the humps in the rain uh, features above it. That's to be expected. You know, if you get more rainfall, you usually have more clouds, okay? But the long wave curve is what was unexpected, the infrared. See, all the climate models act such that if you produce more rainfall, you get more reflected short wave, which would be a negative feedback, but also you get more trapped long wave because it, these rain systems produce cirrus clouds, okay? Cirrus clouds that come out of the top of these rain systems, or even snow systems at high latitudes, those have a strong greenhouse effect, all right, a natural greenhouse effect. But what we found is shortly after the troposphere started to warm up, for a few days there were more cirrus clouds, and then from then on the cirrus clouds coming out of these rain systems dissipated. There was less and less and less cirrus clouds. Or at this point, all I can talk about is radiative fluxes. But if we go to this next slide, for the above plot, there is again the, the temperature trace for the composite interseasonal oscillation. The bottom plot, you see the blue uh, dashed line where it says ice? Well, that's the coverage by cirrus clouds. And you see that shortly after the tropics start to heat up, you know that red line going up to the left of the red pyramid, uh, the ice cover starts going down. This is exactly opposite of the way all climate models behave, okay? This is a big deal. Well, it ends up, if you run the numbers, it's a very strong negative cloud feedback. Uh, 6.5 watts per square meter 
per degree Kelvin. That's the units we, we use. Um, and it's a, a pretty tight relationship you can see there. Now this was kind of unexpected, and I would challenge climate modelers to put this mechanism in their climate models, mimic nature, and then show me how much global warming you get in 100 years when you double the CO2. Well, we thought this was uh, important when it came out last August, and we don't usually do this, but we had the university uh, release, um, you know, put out a press release on this. I had zero calls from media. Zero. Zero. Okay. Uh, got me kind of ticked off, so I called Rush, and he talked about it on the air. <laughs> um, and then I finally did get a call from a reporter out at the, who's, who's the environmental reporter out at San Francisco Chronicle? A uh, lady. Anyway, she called. She says, hey, I heard about your new work on Rush. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. She says, can you help me on this story I'm doing? <laughs> something else. She was doing a story on something else. So I helped her with that. <laughs> oh, I love it. Anyway, after thinking about this uh, climate stuff for the last 20 years or so, I've come to a conclusion. My conclusion is that if there is one organizing principle of temperature control on Earth, as far as the climate system goes, it's precipitation systems. I wouldn't have said this until about a year or so ago. I've had climate modelers tell me, how can precipitation systems be so important? I mean, they're off, you know, they, they cover a small percentage of the Earth at any given time. What they forget is that all of the air, even the air you are breathing right now within a matter of days to weeks, is going to be sucked up into a precipitation system, which is going to take out a certain amount of our main greenhouse gas, water vapor, and then dump the air out into the rest of the atmosphere. And if, I'm sorry, I can't get up there and, and hand wave like we meteorologists like to do when we're pointing to clouds, but I don't know whether you can see it. It represents a huge circulation system, okay? This, is, this cartoon is of a tropical, a warm circulation system. But the same thing is true of snowstorms. You've got rising air and precipitation systems, doesn't matter where they are. You've got a certain amount of water that comes out in the form of precipitation. The rest goes into the environment, which then determines the Earth's greenhouse effect. Now, when the climate modelers say, oh, well, we know there's positive water vapor feedback because you put more CO2 in the atmosphere, it causes a warming tendency, right? I agree. Uh, because a warmer surface evaporates more water, that's going to put more water, our main greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, right? Okay, fine. Well, there you go, positive water vapor feedback. Well, I'm sorry, but you've got like less than a quarter of what determines the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. It isn't the evaporation rate. Even though evaporation is occurring nearly everywhere, all the time, all over the Earth, the atmosphere never fills up with water, does it? It nowhere gets near saturation. And there's only one reason why. Precipitation systems. They are the only way for it to come out again. Guess what we don't understand very well? What happens inside those clouds? That's what we don't understand. It's out of our view. It's hard to measure. I mean, we've flown instrumented planes through there before. But what we really need to know is how those things change with warming. We don't know that. And without knowing that, you can't know what feedbacks are. Now, getting back to my first paper, the infrared iris. See that cirrus coming off the top of that cartoon rain system. Like I said, we found that as these rain systems um, heated up the tropical troposphere, the amount of cirrus coming out the top of them decreased, letting more infrared out to space. That's called the infrared iris. That sort of the atmosphere opens up like the iris of an eye, letting out more infrared space, a natural cooling mechanism. Now, I'm going to go on to the next thing here, which is kind of related, our, our second paper. This is one, this is an interesting story. <laughs> For at least 10 years, I've been thinking about how people that look at the climate system think that they see evidence of positive feedback. For instance, if you have an unusually warm period in the tropics, you'll typically find that there's fewer low clouds. And they'll say, well, see, when the tropics warm up, th there's fewer clouds, which lets more sunlight in, positive feedback. It enhances the warming. And I always wondered. How do they know that it was 
the warmer sea surface that caused the fewer clouds, or it was the fewer clouds that caused the warmer sea surface. Okay? I mean, it's a simple cause and effect question, right? Well, I've got a PhD computational physicist that works with me, very talented, Danny Braswell. He's my co-author. Mild-mannered, brilliant guy. I've been teaching him weather. He's been teaching me physics <laughs> over the years. He's been trying to teach me to think more like the climate modelers, I think, which I, it's good to know, you know, both sides. He says, well, Roy, if you think that there's something else going on, if you can't put it in a model and put it in numbers, you know, then all you're doing is hand-waving. And like I said, meteorologists, you know, do a lot of hand-waving, you know. Um, so, uh, I finally convinced him, well, first, first he said, uh, I said, you know, when I brought up this thing about cause and effect, he said, oh, the modelers couldn't be that dumb. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, well, you're probably right, but let's, let's see. So we came up with the world's smallest climate model. I guarantee that if you contact Guinness, you will not find a smaller climate model than this. Okay, so this is a record. Um, sorry if you hate equations. I actually hate equations too myself, but don't tell anyone. <clears throat> All of those fancy climate models ultimately must collapse, basically, to this simple equation. All this says is on the left-hand side, the change of temperature with time is caused by the stuff on the right-hand side. Now, of course, the modelers are interested in that term called mankind. That's mostly carbon dioxide we're adding, okay? The next term is a feedback term. Feedback means when the temperature changes, it changes something else. So that little alpha T, that represents all of the feedbacks in the climate system. And then nature. Now, to climate modelers, nature means volcanoes, okay? The one thing, what is it, the elephant in the room or the 300-pound gorilla that they never see is the fact that the climate system varies all by itself because it's a nonlinear dynamical system. And they just don't know how to deal with that, so they just ignore it. So when I say nature, what I mean is natural variability. For instance, you know how complicated clouds are, right? Now, do you think the cloud cover on a day-to-day -day basis of the Earth is perfectly constant day after day after day after day after day? You know, 0.7102% one day and the same the next day? No, I don't think so. So I said, what if, as part of nature, you get random noise, okay? Oh, by the way, this is a very flexible model. It can spin uh, like Linda Blair's head, and it can also do the wave thing. So it, it is very flexible. Okay, so mankind, I'm going to assume that's zero, because I'm interested in seeing what natural climate variability does. Feedbacks. Now, this is a magic number. 3.3 watts is the magic number. And this is why climate modelers are so worried about catastrophic global warming. When you heat up the earth, or you even heat up your stove at home, for every degree that it heats up, it puts out more infrared radiation. It's a natural cooling process at a rate of about 3.3 watts per, per square meter per degree, okay? Now, that's the natural cooling process, and they usually don't call it a feedback, but it really is a feedback. Now, I'll scare you about the coming global warming Armageddon. See that 3.3 watts? That's what cools the Earth. If there are positive feedbacks that can offset that 3.3 watts, if you get positive feedbacks that add up to more than that, we're in a heap of trouble because that's where you get your tipping points. You have an inherently unstable climate system. And the climate modelers will tell you, well, but, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty about cloud feedback, sure, but isn't it just as likely that the cloud feedbacks are going to make global warming really bad as they are, you know, not a problem at all? And I say, no, this has nothing to do with probability. The Earth is what it is. It has a certain climate sensitivity. We don't know what it is. We're trying to find out what it is. You know, when the IPCC says they're 90% certain of something, it has nothing to do with probability. It has to do with their faith. Okay, so what we did is we ran this uh, model with just daily noise in low cloud cover. Now, this little model right there, that little equation you can put in your Excel spreadsheet, 
and you can actually play around with it and you get some pretty cool stuff happening. We assumed a heat capacity, that CP all up the way at the left end, that's the heat capacity of the system, you know, like the ocean holds a lot of heat and the land holds less heat. That's the heat capacity thing. Okay, so that is a 30 year temperature trace that we took at random out of many hundreds of runs that we made. Look at the temperature variability. Even on a 10 year time scale, that is entirely caused by daily random cloud cover variations. This is not our discovery. This has been known for decades, but nobody ever talks about it. The climate system, even represented with this simple linear equation that only has three terms, causes all of that structure in the sea surface temperature that you see there. You don't need any external forcing. You don't need a volcano. All you need is anything that generates noise and cloudiness. And we know clouds are complicated things, right? At least we meteorologists know that. And oh, and I think normal people do too. Uh, that's a slight against uh, modelers, by the way, what I just said. <laughs> okay, now this, is, this is, comes down to what I wanted to demonstrate that just that daily random cloud cover variation, if you take the output of this model, see, models can be used for good as well as evil. Isn't this cool? <laughs> um, if you take the output of this model the way we take observational data of the Earth to try to estimate feedbacks, what you do is you plot the temperature variability. See this plot down there, B, that uh, cloud of points? That's a plot of temperature variability versus the variability in how much sunlight is coming in and heating things up, okay? And then you fit a regression line to it, and the slope of that line is supposed to give you the feedback. But what you find is that if you have any of this random stuff going on, you get an error in the feedback that goes in the direction of positive feedback every time. And that, it has to be that way because if cloud changes force temperature changes, it can only go one way energetically. Fewer low clouds can only lead to a warmer surface, not to a cooler surface. So what this represents is a positive feedback error in, their, in estimates when you're looking at the climate system that are fundamentally tied to mixing up cause and effect when you look at the climate system. This thing that, oh, they should have thought of this. Well, no, okay, now to show that this isn't me with my crazy idea, we wrote up this paper, we submitted it climate, okay? I submit, submitted it there because I was directly criticizing the most recent feedback theory of somebody that it published in 2006, two papers on this. I mean, part of the IPCC process, okay? Directly criticizing how he was getting this. He, he had the nature, the nat natural variability term out there too in his equation, but he said, if it's random, it doesn't matter and we can ignore it. Well, what I just showed you is if it's random, it does matter. It causes climate variability that is, you know, that shows temperature variability. Well, <clears throat> of course, the reviews for our paper went to him, since we were criticizing his work, and to Isaac Held, who, those of you who know about the climate community, you know, he's one of our earliest climate modelers, you know, very prestigious kind of guy. Anyway, they both came back. I couldn't believe it. They both said, you're right. In fact, the guy who I was that I was directly criticizing said, you're right. We were wrong in our paper. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> My faith in the scientific process is restored to some extent. Um, I see that the, the slides are, are going ahead without me. Um, we had this problem this morning, didn't we? See, now, when this was happening to Bill Gray, he should have said, see, computers can't even predict the next slide. <laughs> OK. Well, maybe this is my last slide. I don't know. I wasn't watching. Um, this is a plot of all the IPCC models. Um, that 
circle with all the red points. This is from the guy's paper that I was criticizing. The left side of the graph shows global warming. So going up along the graph, that's bad. You know, the higher up you go, the more warming there is. And it, warming is directly related to climate sensitivity. That's why all the data fall kind of like along a line. In other words, as you go up to the right on that graph, what the graph says is the higher the climate sensitivity, the more warming you'll get by the year 2100, you know, based on some assumptions of how much extra CO2. Well, guess what? The observations say, and these aren't my observations. See that first blue thing that just says observations, interannual variability? That is actually published in the same paper that has all those red dots. In other words, they're admitting that all of the climate models are more sensitive than even they measure the climate system to be when they look at real satellite data. And you might wonder, why would they do that if the observation suggests that the climate system isn't that sensitive? Uh, I don't know, except that in the paper they explain it, that see that, that blue thing, uh, the middle one, next to the, 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 the round ellipse, the red ellipse, uh, they said that that has big, huge error bars on it. So therefore, it's such an uncertain estimate of climate sensitivity from the observations, it's not significantly different from what the climate models are saying. Okay, now that red diamond is the theoretical no feedbacks case. That's the thing that I was talking about where if you double CO2 and nothing else changes, that's how much warming you get. And then see that bottom blue one, that's our observations of the system in the tropics. If, if that's actually what's happening on the globe, that's how much global warming you would see uh, by the end of this century is something like, actually these are plotted a little high, it's, it's around half a degree C. Um, and then the last thing I showed, which I cannot show, is that even those observations that they have there up near, near that red ellipse, that has that error I was talking about, that bias in it, a positive feedback bias from not separating out the effects of cause and effect, or you know, the consequences of mixing up cause and effect. So anyway, since the computer is now frozen up, this is probably a good time to start. In summary, I think the recent evidence is showing more and more that the real climate system is less sensitive than the climate modelers think it is. I think there's group think going on in the climate modeling community. You know, you got a whole bunch of people that don't want to depart too much from the consensus. Nobody wants to be the outlier. Nobody wants to be the model that gets the most warming or the least warming. And it's going to be a huge paradigm shift for these guys to go down the road of, oh, well, the climate sensitivity is actually lower, so let's, you know, adjust these models. It, it's going to take time before that ever happens. Anyway, I think it's going to be a matter of years. I've gone through this before about 15 years ago in my previous life as a monitoring rainfall from satellites guy. And uh, you know, when you shake up what everybody has assumed to be true forever, it takes at least three or four years before people start to accept it. So I, I think that's what's going to happen. I just hope that it's not totally ignored. And um, so now hopefully you know that there's actually some real scientists publishing some real data that aren't saying we're all going to burn up in the near future. <laughs>
have a detectable impact on the climate. So I think that's what everybody here should stress. But I didn't, well, you're getting the word out largely to believers here, but I want to emphasize that point. The policy relevance of what Roy just said is, is the key. Yeah, that doesn't need any comment on my part. One more. Actually, a scientific question. Uh-oh. <clears throat> I've been uh, unmasked. You showed some wonderful satellite data. You only have data going back two, three, four years. There's this uh, wonder, what I think is a wonderful data set, the ISCCP yeah. data set that comes out of NASA. I wonder if you would uh, be able to comment on the quality of that data and the yeah, reliability the of using that data. It goes back to, like, 1984. I'm just real curious about your views about it. Um, well, there's not only the ISCAP data, which is um, older, less good cloud measurements. Uh, there's also older radiation budget measurements. So this kind of stuff has been done. In fact, their estimates, this blue thing is based on um, older measurements uh, from older satellites that aren't quite as good. Yeah, I think, I think something could be done with the ISCAP data, but, you know, really the highest quality stuff is only in the last six years. But, you know, it could be that something additional could be done. You know, the more data you have, the more you can do, you know. So I don't doubt that other things could be done, and I think I'm just starting to scratch the surface of this stuff. You know, this is just a crude demonstration of some stuff that now other people need to get involved in. Yes, the ISCAP data has uh, calibration problems, and last I knew, Bill Rousseau had presented and showed that basically they had to detrend the data. That's the last I knew. I mean, the stuff shows a trend, but they don't trust the calibration, so they just detrend the data, and you know, because the data is not good enough to show a trend. Okay. Thanks very much. Sorry.